Hello all, and welcome to Introduction to Medicaid Waiver, Self-Direction and Independent Housing, sponsored by NYSARC Trust Services. My name is Angie Fructuoso Solasquez, and I am the Director of Admissions and Community Integration at ADAPT of the Hudson Valley. At ADAPT HV, I oversee all new admissions for the agency and the community-based programs that support 235 people with disabilities within our day habilitation, supported employment, respite, and community habilitation programs, as well as, well as our ISS apartments. Uh, a few housekeeping rules before we begin. Please put any questions for the panelists in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. If you're having technical difficulties, there will be answers to common questions in the chat. This session is being recorded and you can watch it again online at www.adaptcommunitynetwork.org. And if you haven't done so already, please follow us on social media at Adapt We Change. Now, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's session featuring Donna Maxson. Donna is the parent of a non-speaking adult son who has autism. Professionally, Donna's background is in corporate training and development. But for the past eight years, Donna has worked primarily as an independent self-direction broker. Donna is also a certified housing navigator, which allows her to work with people and their circle of supports to develop and implement housing action plans. Additionally, Donna works with ArchCare as an independent housing managing agent. Please let's get started and welcome Donna Maxson. Okay, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here today. Uh, what a great day. Finally, we have some sunshine. I'm here with my community people um, who, who, who are similar to me and what's important to me. And I'm so honored to be asked to speak about three topics that I am very passionate about, the Medicaid waiver, self-direction and independent housing. Uh, I especially appreciate being asked to speak with ADAPT because when my son Donald was diagnosed with autism uh, back in 1993, uh, ADAPT did the diagnosis and the social worker there, Lorraine was extremely kind to me. And I remember that kindness. And in respect to that kindness, I am a, forever a friend to ADAPT. Um, and I also remember the kindness of so many parents who have helped me along the way. And I will always make time to talk to other parents about anything I know and share what I have learned along my, my journey. Um, and I appreciate that introduction of all the things that I am. Uh, the most important thing is a proud parent. And I'd like to introduce you to my family. Uh, to my left is my son, Bradley, who is in a corporate attorney for an international bank. Um, the one with the very mild hairdo, that would be me. Uh, my husband, Barry, who is my hero, and my son, Donald, a very talented and special person. Uh, he's now 30 years old. And, you know, Donald has taught me everything important that I know about life. He's taught me that I am strong and brave. I used to think I was weak and I am strong and brave for my son and for everyone else who is in my orbit. He's taught me to notice and appreciate even the smallest things and celebrate every victory. He's taught me to be proud and to be generous and to have compassion. He's shown me what hard work and persistence is about because he is an extremely hard worker and nothing comes easy for him. He's introduced me to a wonderful community of people and each one of you that are here today is part of that community. So I thought I'd let him quickly introduce himself uh, to you. And I have this very, very teeny weeny video of him in his ASL class. He takes American Sign Language class one-on-one -on -one through his self-direction plan. And I'm gonna be very entertained to see the sign language interpreter interpret the sign language. <laughs> so let's see. Um, 
mat ne ne ita ita oh my name is Donald D O N A L D thank you thank you and um and you know he's uh he's out in the community right now uh, today doing personal training, later taking a piano class. He's out with his staff having a, a nice day. So anyway, I am here to talk to you about three ginormous topics. I could fill a college semester on these three topics. Uh, it's the Medicaid waiver, self-direction, and independent housing. Uh, and I'm very passionate about all these three topics. So I'm gonna try to do the best I can in a short amount of time and allow for some questions. I wanna get to uh, the big picture. What are these things? Who is eligible? And if you are interested, what are some steps you should take? Which I think is cutting, cutting right to the chase. Um, a little bit about the Medicaid waiver. You know, I do find that sometimes I meet parents of young children and they are very interested in school. We just had a fantastic, fantastic presentation about IEP, I learned so much, um, but they don't know much about the waiver. And uh, the waiver is really something it doesn't, can't get involved in school or health, but it can provide important home and community-based services when the child comes home from school on the weekends, you know, during school breaks. Uh, it is facilitated by the Office for People with Developmental Disabilities, opwdd.ny.gov. Um, and, uh, you know, if you Google that, there is a, trem a tremendous amount of information for you to read. Uh, each county does have a local office called the DDRO. We love acronyms. Developmental Disabilities Regional Office. And, um, you know, the, the one of the main concepts is uh, services should be individualized and person-centered, meaningful for that person. Uh, services could be provided directly through OPWDD or through a nonprofit agency affiliated with OPWDD. Some examples, and by the way, I lifted this from the site, are habilitation services, respite care, service coordination, and adaptive technologies. Who is eligible? Well, those that have a diagnosis of a developmental disability. There has to be an onset prior to age 22. You could apply after 22. I have a man on my caseload now. He's in his 50s. He lived in Long Island. His mother passed away. He came to Staten Island to, uh, you know, to live with, you know, with family. We got him his own apartment and um, he applied in his fifties and was approved. But he was able to prove that this was a, a developmental disability that he had, well, something that he was born with. There is something called the front door process, which has nothing to do with a door, uh, but um, uh, it, it, it does require a, a psychological report, medical or special, uh, specialty reports that support diagnostic findings, social and developmental history, psychosocial reports, and other information requested by the eligibility coordinator. Steps to take. Um, well, if you do not have the Medicaid waiver but want to learn more, there is a front door information set sessions given at least once a month. They do it now uh, uh, remotely. They have their own platform. You can uh, schedule, register, attend. Uh, your care manager could help you with that. They offer uh, these sessions in different languages. Um, uh, after you do the, the session, then the, you're going to have to start getting evaluations and filling out a paperwork to apply. This is not a fast, uh, this is not a fast process. Um, it, this is very complicated. You know, it, I've heard it take six months. I've heard it take longer. This requires the, the, the person, the focused person, if it's a self-advocate or the family member, the advocates to be persistent, follow up and have patience. Um, I have the Medicaid waiver 
for my son, Donald, since he's three years old and he's 30 now. Uh, so I have a lot of experience of having the waiver. It's really been a lifeline for us. Uh, and I have had the waiver in, in two different ways, traditional services and self-direction. And I'm gonna be talking about that next. But anyway, at some point, if you go through the front door, hopefully you will be approved. When you get approved, you get a care manager. There are, um, one of the other speakers mentioned, care coordination organizations. Some of them have eligibility departments, by the way, and they're specialists on, you know, little teeny questions. This happens, how do I overturn it? Like you need a, an eligibility specialist. A lot of these CCOs, care coordination organizations have specialists that can answer and troubleshoot uh, these little questions that, you know, these important questions, but um, so you get a care manager and the care manager has many roles, kind of like a case per case worker for you. Uh, one of the most important roles is to author, author the life plan. And the life plan um, is a guiding document or your prescription for services. Uh, the section one has a narrative, a story about the focused person. It's very important that the family, the person themselves, the advocate read the story. And if it's not complete, recommend how it should be revised because you know the person best. Um, the, you, you need it to tell a complete and accurate story about the person's life, daily activities, relationships, home, uh, section two lists goals that the person will be working on with the help of the Medicaid waiver. Uh, section three lists safeguards or, or safe safety rules. Section four, Medicaid funded services. Section five, state funded items, contacts, mother, father, care manager, broker, fiscal intermediary representative, all of those contacts should be listed there. If there's agency services used, the agency personnel should be listed there. Uh, doctors, pharmacy. And this document must be reviewed twice per year. And it's very important that the family, uh, you know, make time and prioritize these meetings because, uh, you know, to, to maintain the waiver, we have to follow. That's what the most important rule to uh, make sure that the life plan is reviewed twice annually. All right, now once you, get, uh, once you get approved for the Medicaid waiver, you have two choices. You could have traditional services or self-direction. I have experience with both because my son Donald from age three to age 21 had traditional services. And from age 21 to age 30, he has self-direction. I believe that we need to have choices for everyone. There is no right choice for everyone. For certain people, traditional services will be best. For other people, self-direction will be best. Um, and we just need to have enough of everything. <laughs> so anyway, some examples of what is available to people with a traditional waiver. Uh, is site-based respite programs. You know, the word respite means relief to the caregiver, but the agencies have made a lot of these respite programs so fun that the people love to go. Um, uh, but uh, they, and they can be many different things. They can be after school or after day hab, like afternoon uh, specialty classes, art, or um, you know, a, a social club, um, it could be a trip, it could be camp. These are all examples of agency respite programs. You could have respite staff, that staff that comes to the house to keep the person safe and supervised. Uh, you could have agency community habilitation staff, better known as ComHab, um, uh, and they are there to work on goals. Uh, you could have for adults day hab programs. There are some supplemental day hab programs that teens could participate in. Uh, housing could be a certified setting. The uh, the early session this morning we talked about certified and non-certified settings. I'm going to get more into that. 
but that certified setting basically means usually, you know, that an agency or OPWDD itself is involved. Or it could be independent. You could have independent housing with a, with a traditional waiver, a standalone housing subsidy. You don't need self-direction. Although I do think that if you are doing independent housing, self-direction will provide the most support. And I will be talking about that, but you don't need it. You can do it with a traditional waiver. Uh, many agencies, including I believe ADAPT themselves said that they have a department that can do standalone independent housing. I, I heard everyone calling it a voucher. <laughs> Uh, it's not exactly a voucher, but, uh, you know, it's something like a voucher, I guess. Supported employment for adults is another program uh, that is a, that is agency run. With a traditional waiver, no one's talking dollar signs. There's no prices on anything. So pretty much you have an unlimited budget. I compare it to an American Express gold card. You could use it as much as you want but there's only limited items available. The items that are on this list, a, a few other things. This is not a complete list. Technology, there's, a, there's some other things that are waiverized that you could buy with your traditional waiver. You don't need self-direction. Limited items uh, available for some people. This is enough and this, this is the correct thing. What about self-direction? That's the other choice. Uh, and what is self-direction? Well, it is an international movement for social reform available in many states, not only New York, available in many countries. In fact, many years ago, uh, when I started with self-direction, I started my, with my son's plan in 2012. It launched in 2013, but I think around 2015, we had some visitors uh, from Scotland who do self-direction there. And we had a very interesting meeting with them. Uh, and if I had to give a headline, I would say that it gives the focus person and their advocates control. And if you like control, you, you like, you're gonna like self-direction. <laughs> um, if you're the type of person that likes to have control, you would like self-direction, I think. Uh, Self-direction is a Medicaid waiver service. It gives the person or their advocates their circle of support, budget authority. You get a certain dollar amount to use for a fiscal year. And uh, you decide how to portion that and use it. Let's say it's an adult and their budget amount was 100,000 for the year. You, the person decides, I want to use 60000 for staffing. I want to buy $20,000 worth of community classes. I want to go use agency site-based respite for 5000 You decide how to use the money. You also have employer authority. That means you hire, recruit, supervise, and set the, uh, the, the hourly pay rate for the staff within guidelines. There is a lot of rules and guidelines. It's not just <laughs> any amount, you know, but you, you can decide to give someone a raise, to set their rate at $25 an hour, $20 an hour, you know, certainly it has to be over uh, the county uh, minimum, definitely. Uh, you have a limited and finite budget. You know, with the traditional waiver, you had an American Express gold card with this, you have a debit card loaded with a certain amount of money. You can overuse it. You have to stay within the budget amount, but you have a large variety of things to choose from. Things that you can have with the traditional waiver. Um, typically people who have a strong circle of support or a personal network and, and are able to give a high level of involvement like self-direction. Again, not for everyone. So an important concept here is the budget or the PRA, personal resource amount. Um, so how do they come up with this number? Well, it's based on uh, uh, the DDP2 scores. 
the DDP2 assessment that the care manager does. Right now, I believe they do it every two years, the, this assessment. And those that have low scores have a low level of disability, have a lower budget amount. Those that have high scores, they demonstrate a higher level of disability and their budget amount is higher. Self-direction is fair. There's also different maximums for children versus adults. Uh, because the equation factors in that children are in school from nine to three and you don't use the waiver in school. So uh, in general, the yes, the amounts are typically lower for children and higher for adults. Um, finite amount. Uh, well, you, you, yes, it is a finite limited amount and you cannot exceed the amount and all waiver services must be deducted. They have some agency respite, uh, you know, all of the traditional services are the housing subsidy, everything gets deducted. However, um, uh, it is an annual budget and it's refreshed with new funding every year. Uh, the budget includes some Medicaid funded items and some state funded items. So self-direction has certain items that are only available through self-direction such as there's something called family reimburse respite. Uh, it's up to 3000 per fiscal year. And um, uh, it can be, it's a very flexible funding stream, state funded, but typically it's used if the, uh, let's say if the family needs to have someone stay with the person to keep them safe and supervised, maybe they're not cleared through the agency, they pay them, they can be reimbursed up to 3,000 a year. That's what family reimbursed respite pretty much is. IDGS, Individual Directed Goods and Services. There's actually 12 things on the list. I, I'm not gonna go through all the things because we have limited time, but some of the popular things from IDGS are community classes. So uh, you could go to a karate class, a storefront, in the community. You could use a personal training studio. If your child likes art, you can take an art class at the Y or anywhere else in the community. Um, uh, uh, music classes, you know, there's uh, driving classes. Of course, the FI or the fiscal intermediary have to approve uh, all of the classes, but um, community classes are available could be reimbursed. Sometimes they accept direct payment through the agency. Uh, memberships, if the person wants to be a member which offers them participation in the community, self-direction puts people into the community. Um, uh, so memberships to the Y or to uh, a gym, LA Fitness or any of the others, uh, that could be reimbursed or even a bowling league you're participating in the community. Uh, transportation, if the staff drives the person around, they could be reimbursed for their mileage or an Uber or a Metro card. A paid neighbor is available for people that use independent housing. It's an IDGS line and it's a professional neighbor. They receive a stipend, a monthly stipend to be on call to do things that are outlined in a contract. But let's say someone can't ambulate and the staff doesn't come one morning. There's a snowstorm. They, they, the person can call the neighbor to come and assist them. Uh, or if the family is going away to look in on the person, to be a professional neighbor. And this is available for people who have independent housing. Um, household supports available for those that have independent housing if you wanna have a cleaning service. If you live in a house and have to have a gardener or snow removal, these are things, these are the type of things that could be reimbursed through IDGS household supports. Then we have OTPS, which is state funded, limited to 3000 per year, other than personal services. Some examples, staff activity fee. So the staff took the person to the movies. You could be reimbursed for the staff's movie ticket because the staff is, 
helping the person participate in the community, especially if that was written into the plan, I, you know, that the person wants to go to the movies, uh, I would say definitely to make sure that's listed, the types of things, the, the types of places the person likes to go. Clothing for adults up to 250 a year, um, utilities and internet for those that live alone uh, could be reimbursable. Uh, phone and transportation for the person themselves, if they're taking an Uber, um, you know, if they have accessoride, little copay uh, receipts, um, other things. Um, or if the parent is driving them, that's possible too. Support brokerage is a category only available through uh, self-direction because you must have a broker. And a live-in caregiver is also something available through self-direction for those that live uh, uh, independently in the community. So let's see, self-direction puts people in the community. And sometimes when you're in the community, like Ellen, you dance. Um, and so I thought I'd just break this up a little and just show you a quick, a happy video of my son making a friend in the community. He was out with his ComHab staff and uh, they went to Dunkin' Donuts. And by the way, this video went viral. If you put into Google keywords, Donald Simon, dancing, Dunkin', autism, you'll see it was on the Huffington Post. And really it reached millions of people, this clip of Donald out in the community with his ComHab worker, having some fun and the kind Duncan Barista found a way to communicate with Donald through music and dancing and fun. And Donald made a new friend that day. A little Lady Gaga and, oh, wait a minute now, let's see. And a couple of months later, Donald, who takes art classes and is a very talented artist, and he does this through his self-direction plan. Um, he had an art show at the Staten Island Pride Center. Uh, and uh, that night he sold $1,400 worth of art and was happy to donate this money to the Pride Center as he is a, um, a philanthropist and an ally too. And my whole family was there with Brian, our new friend, the dancing Duncan barista. So, uh, you know, we've had a great experience with self-direction. Um, so who is eligible if you're interested in self-direction? Well, you must have your Medicaid waiver approved. You must have a care manager and a life plan. Sometimes people call me um, and, uh, you know, they, they don't, they didn't even go to the front door yet. No, you, you have to, you know, you have to take care of that first. Um, and really you have to want to be involved and have control. You have to want to manage, oops, sorry, manage a budget and handle paperwork. And you have to be able to recruit and supervise staff. You know, these are some of the roles that the family plays. There are others too, you know. So steps to take. If you're interested in self-direction, steps to take is to attend an OPWDD self-direction info session. OPWDD will not entertain any new requests unless there is a uh, confirmation email that the focus person themselves or their advocate have attended the session. You have to have uh, this uh, email. And your care manager will be able to get you, uh, you know, how to register. Um, and they have them, you know, several times a month and they're right from your home. Uh, then you have to develop a team. You have to be active. It's an active process. Uh, you have to recruit a broker. Uh, the broker will help you find a fiscal intermediary agency because as parents, we can, you know, we, yes, we have budget authority, but we're not writing the checks. <laughs> we can't do that. It's too much withhold taxes and all that. No, we have an agency. The agency helps with uh, paying the bills, handling the payroll, benefit administration, 
um, handling reimbursements, clearing staff through the Justice Department procedures. Um, and of course, your care manager is a mandatory active member of this team. Uh, and of course, you're gonna, if you're gonna have self-direction uh, and you have staff, you're gonna be needing to get self-hired staff. Uh, you need to apply for a startup budget through self-direction. And basically the real meaning of that is that this will allow a broker and fiscal intermediary to join the team to assist you to develop a person-centered proposal, a self-direction proposal that will include a budget spreadsheet where you're demonstrating budget authority. Um, and, and you're gonna develop a person-centered proposal. Uh, usually if you're having ComHab staff, that includes a staff action plan and safeguards. Um, you're going to be implementing and managing the plan after it gets approved and, you know, on, uh, ongoing monitoring the expenditures. If you put 12000 for classes and you use these things at the prescribed rate, you would be using about 1000 a month. If you see the first month you use 2000 maybe I need to make some adjustments. It's focus person and their advocates role to monitor the expenditures, manage the monthly paperwork. There's a monthly note that has to be uh, uh, authored and submitted. Supervise staff, meet with the team, revise the plan and budget is needed. It's a project and definitely people will tell you, other parents will tell you that you get better at this as you go. It's, it's a lot to learn. It's very, to me, fascinating interesting and really a lifeline for my son. Uh, he, he's so happy every day going places with his staff and, uh, you know, just, uh, it's really, it's really the right thing for him. Uh, traditional services was worked very well when he was younger. Traditional services may work well for you now. Um, we all need to have choice. So that brings me to the third part of this presentation, which is about housing. And just like you have choices with the waiver, you have choices with housing, um, certified or non-certified. Again, certified usually implies that either OPWDD itself or one of the nonprofit agencies affiliated with OPWDD is uh, running the housing. With non-certified, uh, that usually means that it's independent housing in the community. So, you know, these, uh, these, these words were kind of mentioned at the uh, introductory session this morning. Maybe I have a little teeny bit more information. I can't get into too much detail. But uh, when, we, uh, when we talk about uh, IRA, I think a lot, I, someone mentioned that uh, typically the word group home uh, I think comes to mind or a community residence, um, a supervised IRA, individual residential alternative. Uh, supervised usually means 24 hour staffing. A supportive IRA uh, usually means that staffing is not 24 hours. It's based on the person's individualized uh, needs. You know, sometimes this is more like a supportive apartment run by an agency. That's an example of a supportive IRA. Could be different, little different gyrations there. An ICF, intermediate care facilities, these are examples of what certified housing are, is, uh, is something like a group home too, but uh, usually for people that have more medical needs. Uh, a specialty hospital is for those that have it very high medical needs. Uh, so steps to take if you're interested in certified housing. Talk to your care manager. Uh, there is a, a process called CRO, Certified Residential Opportunities. If you Google OPWDD CRO, you will find the form. Uh, it's on their site. It's a form that needs to be completed usually the person, their advocates, and the care manager will complete that form. And it's submitted to the uh, regional office and um, uh, you know, agencies review. I'll, I will throw in, because this is really not my specialty. I work with, I 
My specialty is independent housing, which I'll be talking about next, but I will, um, I will add that what I do know is that it's not a list where number one goes first and number 100 goes last, if there were 100 people on the list. Uh, I, I understand that based on the application, the life plan, very important, um, uh, then it's going to be rated in level of priority. Those with urgent priority move to the front and those that it isn't urgent, you know, there's three levels of prioritization. So uh, if you are interested, you do wanna work with your care manager to complete the, the Crow form. All right, so what is non-certified housing? Well, it could be, it's definitely independent in the community. Um, it could be, it's, it's, it's some kind of a setting that anyone could rent or live in. It could be an apartment, a condo, a co-op, a house, or something called a legal ADU, accessory dwelling unit. I haven't come across any of those myself, but I think that's something like a guest house on your property, which has a C of O and is legally rentable, you know, something like that. Very important, most important is the focused person's name has to be on the deed or the lease to be eligible for um, a subsidy. And uh, if you want more information, because this is a huge topic, uh, I recommend you go to the New York Housing Resource Center uh, website, nyhrc.org. There is tremendous amounts of documents, YouTube videos to look through. You can join their mailing list and uh, be invited to many, many information sessions. Um, through the NYHRC, they run the housing navigation program that was mentioned this morning too. I happen to be a housing navigator. Um, so <clears throat> that's one huge resource. Another thing, if you're interested to attend the Downstate Independent Housing Forum, uh, my friends and colleagues, Marietta, Semra, and I, we run monthly meetings on topics related to independent housing. It's an hour and a half meeting. The first hour we have a topic and the last half hour we open it up, participate in the conversation. We welcome people from every county. We're not, we're not only for the downstate, uh, we have people coming from every county and uh, it's been very interesting uh, to learn from each other because there's been a lot of changes to housing recently, independent housing, a lot of changes. So, uh, people are interested in the OPWDD rent subsidy, formerly known as the ISS rent subsidy. Uh, they now call it the OPWDD rent subsidy. Um, you can get that through a standalone traditional rate waiver. You do not need self-direction. There are agencies that have, well, they may still call themselves an ISS department, but uh, uh, you know, it's a housing department. And and uh, if your name is on the lease or the deed, you may be eligible. And you have uh, OPWDD eligibility, of course. Um, if you have self-direction, then it will be built into the self-direction budget. How is it calculated, the subsidy? Uh, well, they do uh, uh, calculate, they have their equation. OPWDD has an equation built into a spreadsheet. You put the numbers in and the amount of the subsidy that you're eligible comes out. So you have to enter all the income and the equation does uh, factor that you will pay 30% of your income towards the rent, just like section eight, that's the same uh, rule there. Uh, there are deductions that are allowed. There is utility and insurance offsets that reduce things and increase the, uh, the subsidy potentially. And there's maximum payment standards by county. Mr. Bearden mentioned this morning, I was so interested that uh, we have been working with the 2012 HUD FMR rates all this time and now it's coming, we're getting, uh, you know, it's gonna be increasing. So we're very excited about that, uh, that we're going to be getting higher rates. Um, and uh, that that's the maximum 
payment standards. So uh, another thing to know is that a transition stipend is available if it's a person that lives at home with their family, let's say, and then trans transitioning into their own apartment, they would be eligible for up to $3,000 once in a lifetime to help buy furniture and items for their new apartment. Um, if they're transitioning from uh, a certified setting, they will be probably uh, uh, eligible for $5,000 to buy things for their, uh, for their new home. Uh, we have a lot of written information we appreciate having through this new OPWDD housing ADM that was released in, on March 10th. I'm giving you the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the website link here, but if you Google OPWDD housing subsidy, you probably can find this and it's very interesting. There's a two hour uh, presentation on that link that you can learn more about independent housing. Uh, there's all the attachments and forms, frequently asked questions, everything is there. Um, so that's uh, about the OPWDD rent subsidy. So this is my son Donald and his uh, ComHab staff. Uh, they were, uh, he just gave me this picture last week and they just looked both so happy that I just had to share the picture. <laughs> Um, so anyway, self-direction and OPWDD rent subsidy. Why do I think self-direction is the best way to have um, a rent subsidy? Well, you know, the rent payments are deducted from the PRA that will come off of the of the, um, the budget amount, the maximum budget amount. But the special support that is available through self-direction is, you know, through, uh, and these are just some samples, examples, but through IDGS, your paid neighbor, uh, the household supports to have a cleaning service come in, you know, or help with the, a gardener, or things like that. OTPS, this is big to be able to get help reimbursements with the utilities, internet, phone. Um, there's also things like OTPS items uh, that support health, safety, and independence. And let's say for, you know, uh, this morning in the intro session, we there was some talk about technology helping independent living plans. Yes, yes. And, but that technology usually has a monthly fee. And that fee may be reimbursable through a self-direction budget. Um, having a live-in caregiver, of course, your self-hired staffing, um, a housing navigator, which you can find out more about through that same uh, website, nyhrc.org. Uh, there's over 400 housing navigators available in, um, in New York now. And we are specially trained to help people develop housing action plans to discuss how to increase benefits and decrease costs to create a plan that is person-centered and sustainable uh, to help people transition into independent housing and to help manage crisis within housing plans. Uh, and that can be funded through self-direction. The fiscal. Oh, yeah, I apologize. Sorry for the interruption. Donna, we just have a few more minutes before we start okay. taking some questions, okay? I oh, am... you can start typing questions into the chat. All right. Thank you. I, I've timed it perfectly. I hope I'm not going too fast for the uh, sign language interpreters. <laughs> Uh, okay, um, so the fiscal intermediary typically provides the landlord monthly uh, check for the rent or the portion of the rent that is, uh, you know, payable through the uh, through the budget. Um, if you if you have a standalone subsidy, the agency will pay, and sometimes the agency will also provide ComHab and other services if you have a standalone uh, OPWDD housing subsidy. So. Anyway, um, uh, uh, but, uh, this is working out fine because here's my, uh, my last slide. I'm Donna Maxson. Um, I am an independent uh, self-direction broker. I do have a very full caseload. I am here today to talk to other parents about what I believe and what I know. Um, I'm a certified housing navigator. I'm very interested to help people 
that want to do independent housing plans because it's the hardest thing to do. Um, I am a certified plan network facilitator, which is a system used in Canada to help uh, strengthen circle of supports, develop personal networks. When we talk about sustainability and what will happen after I'm gone, we talk about having other people involved. Um, I'm an independent uh, housing management, uh, independent housing managing agent for the New York Archdiocese, developing independent housing plans. And I most importantly, I hope I am a proud parent, but I, I hope I am a friend and advocate to uh, to many. Um, and you know, if I could ever help you, best to uh, email. But I'm giving you my phone number too. Uh, I will be speaking at the New York Alliance Living and Working in the Community Conference. Uh, my topic with Marietta and Semra uh, is housing tools that work. And that's on October 17th up in Saratoga Springs. So um, uh, uh, if there's some questions I could answer, I'll be happy to try to. Yes, we do have some questions. The first one is, we are still a few years away from my daughter's 18th birthday. I think she will need guardianship or conservatorship. Will she be eligible for self-directed self housing subsidy if the parent is named guardian? Also, what would you advise families do leading up to the age of 18 um, of a child as many agencies have years long waiting lists? Can the parent get on the waiting list earlier? Okay, well, uh, I think the first part of the question was, you know, if I become the guardian, can my, can my child be eligible for an independent housing subsidy? And the answer is yes. Um, the second part of the question is if I want certified housing, because you don't, there is no list for independent housing, right? You, it's, you have to develop that plan. You have to find a appropriate, uh, uh, place. And, you know, you, in other words, you pick you, if you want a roommate, where do you want to live? What, what's important to the person? So there is no list, but there is a list for certified housing. Um, I believe you can put your person on the list, you know, as, as you know, at any age. Um, for independent housing, you do have to be 18 years or older. For certified housing, sometimes they have certified. I know of people who uh, some agencies have certified uh, settings where they have younger people. So you, you, can, you can apply, I believe, at any time. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, can kids that are homeschooled get self-direction and receive services during the school day, or is that a conflict? Um, kids that are homeschooled can definitely get self-direction. You cannot use the waiver during school hours, and many FIs or fiscal intermediary agencies, FIs, uh, they will ask for the school schedule. And I believe, uh, you know, and now I believe this would be, this is a, a, you know, it's a unique question that would have to be raised between the agency and the family. Uh, you know, if, if, if they're homeschooled and the hours are different, could they use the services uh, during non-school hours? And I think that that would have to be, uh, probably different agencies would see it different ways. Okay. Thank you so much for that, wonderful. Uh, the next question is, can you go from a traditional to a self-direction if you're already in a support in supported living? Uh, well, the, I, I, I'm not sure exactly what that means, but you definitely, if you wanted to move out of an IRA and into, into independent housing, that's definitely possible. Uh, and you would get the higher, uh, subsidy, by the way, that would be moving from a certified setting to a um, non-certified setting. If the question is, can I have self-direction while I'm living in a certified setting? The answer is yes, but it's very limited what could be used. Um, it's called a, uh, 
well, let's see now, there is a, other than residential budget, we don't see too many of those, but I do know someone who does have that because their child can't, the child lives in a supported, I, a supervised IRA, but they cannot find a day hab. So they have self-hired staff between nine and three, Monday to Friday. And the budget is it's a very small amount because it, it, you know, it factors in that you're getting uh, the housing. So either of those things are possible, it, no matter which way the question was. Thank you for that. The next question is, how do we get support for those with a dual diagnosis of IDD and mental health? You know, that would be a good question, I think, for an eligibility uh, specialist, because we, you know, in other words, the, I think the question is, is that my child or uh, I myself could qualify for either the mental health waiver or the developmental disability waiver. Uh, and at some point you have to, I believe the person has to make a choice to fill out, you know, go through the front door here or go through the mental health uh, process. Um, you have, you know, you have to, uh, you have to qualify and be eligible based on OPWDD standards, you know, a criterion. Um, but more than that, I can't really tell you. I, 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 I know that we do have people in OPWDD that do have a dual diagnosis. Thank you. Uh, we have time for probably two more questions. Um, the next one is, is there any way a person on self-direction can share a rental unit with a parent, be on the lease and get a monthly rent subsidy or does living with the parent disallow this? No, that's a very good question. <laughs> Uh, all these questions are good. No, but uh, that's a very interesting question. I, I, I'm interested in that question. You see now, if it's two adults, let's say, for instance, single, uh, single mother and, you know, adult 30 year old daughter and they share an apartment and it's a rental and both names are on, on the lease, then the person, let's say the daughter has OPWDD uh, benefits, is, is eligible for 50% of the rent as their subsidy. You know, it has to be crunched through all of these equations. But um, if now let's just say, let's say the, that same duo, the mother, the adult mother and the adult daughter uh, live in a house, and the mother owns the house and the daughter is not on the deed and she's not on the mortgage, then no, she can't get a housing subsidy. But if, you know, if, if, the, if the daughter is on the deed and is on the mortgage, then yes, she could. Yeah. And also if you had self-direction, you could uh, probably get 50% reimbursement for the Con Ed, the National Grid, if you have, um, you know, if you're paying uh, for the internet, all of that, because the state will not pay for the mother, right? Because she, she is an OPWDD eligible just for the adult daughter. Thank you for that. And the final question, Donna, is what is a broker and what do they do? Um, well, it's, it's really my, my most favorite uh, job I ever had, I have to tell you. And I spent uh, 30 years being Bette Midler in case I'm flipping anyone out. <laughs> I, 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 my background, I, I was in entertainment, but um, I'm now a self-direction broker and it's my most favorite job I ever had because first of all, I find the whole thing extremely fascinating and interesting. And then I get to help people that I want, that I, that deserve this help that I want to be with, that, that I, I, you know, that I enjoy being with and I, that I could see what the work means to them. But uh, a broker does have a certificate from OPWDD. There is a class that you do attend um, and the broker helps develop um, uh, the self-direction proposal. Uh, it, really a lot of training and education for the family to help the parents understand what self-direction is, 
how it works, what their responsibilities are, and helps them maintain and implement the plan and make changes and revisions as we learn, as we start using the plan and we learn things. Um, I, I'm an independent broker, which means that um, I work for myself. I'm self-employed. I make my own hours. Uh, and um, uh, and I, I think that, does that answer what a, a self-direction, and you need one. Although um, if you are a parent, you could become a broker and just manage your own child's case. You're allowed to do that if, if, uh, if you want to, or you can have a broker. And their fee is paid through the self-direction funding stream. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your insight in this topic. Um, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. If we did not get to your question during the session, we will get to them after the event. Uh, I just want to remind everyone, following the conclusion of this event, you will receive an email with a link for a survey. Please complete the survey for a chance to win an Amazon gift card. Uh, I do hope you will join us at 1 p.m. for our parent panel, How to Be an Effective Advocate for Your Child with a Disability. Thank you all.